Also scroll forward, but I always use it to scroll back. Yeah, I send a link in the chat. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. So uh, may I present you? Ready? So I'm very glad to present Jillian Luo from uh, University of Minnesota and announce his talk on a local trace formula for the local gangross prasad conjecture for special orthogonal groups. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so the title of my talk is a local trace formula for the local gangross prasad conjecture for special orthogonal groups. Okay, uh, so Let's first review some classical results. Um, we fix a pair of compact orthogonal groups, SO2 embeds into SO3, okay. Uh, then let's study the following multiplicity space, the SO2 equivalent space from pi to the trivial representation. Here pi is an irreducible representation of SO3, okay. Uh, then by forbidden reciprocity, uh, you can show that the dimension is equal to the embedding for, uh, the multiplicity of pi embeds into the induction from SO2 to SO3 of the trivial representation, okay. Then on the other hand, uh, the induced space can be identified with um, L2 space on the two dimensional sphere, okay. So the problem reduced to study the spectral decomposition of SO3 acting on the two dimensional sphere, okay. Uh, then this is a classical result from uh, spherical harmonics. You know that this L2 space admits the following uh, direct sum decomposition. Here HL is the space of spherical harmonics of degree L and the dimension is 2L plus one, okay. In particular, it gives you a irreducible representation of SO3. And uh, you can show that the uh, for any pi, which is the irreducible representation of SO3, then this multiplicity space uh, is equal to one, okay. On the other hand, by Schur's orth orthogonality, you can easily show that the multiplicity can also be given by an integral formula involving the restriction of the uh, trace character of pi to SO2, okay. <laughs> Uh, so then uh, let's turn to the main concern of our talk. Okay, let's fix F to be a local field of characteristic zero. And we fix a pair of quadratic space W embeds into V. And uh, let's assume that the W perp uh, inside V is of split of odd dimension, okay. And we let N to be the unipotent radical uh, of the parabolic subgroup of SOV stabilizing the full isotropic flag determined by W perp. And we let G to be SOW cross SOV, okay. And we let H to be SOW semi-direct product with N. Here, um, SOW embeds into G diagonally, okay. And we fix, could see a generic character of N which extend to H, okay. Then the triple GH C is called a gangrous Prasad triple, okay. And uh, uh, we are going to study the following multiplicity space, okay. The, for any pi, which is the irreducible representation of G, uh, we study equivariant maps from a, uh, pi to CF, okay, which is HF equivariant. Uh, then this is a non-trivial theorem, which says the multiplicity is always lower than or equal to one, okay. Uh, when F is p-adic, uh, it's proved by Eisenberg, Gurich, Rallis, and Schiffman for i equals zero, and by Gangor's Passat, reducing the general case to i equals zero case, okay. And when F is Archimedean, 
is proved by Sun and Zhu for I equals zero and by Jiang Sun Zhu reducing the general case to I equals zero case. <clears throat> Uh, then uh, the local gangrus Pasa conjecture uh, suggests that the multiplicity uh, has more stable behavior by considering the local Vogan packet associated to the GGP triple. Okay. Uh, to introduce the local Vogan packet associated to the triple, we consider the pure inner forms of SOW, which is parametrized by H1 of SOW, okay, FSOW. <laughs> And the point here is that for any alpha in the cohomology set, uh, you can associate to it a pair of quadratic space. Here, uh, W alpha is a quadratic space so that it has the same dimension and the discriminant with W. And then you can define V alpha to be W alpha direct sum with W perf. <coughs> and you can associate to a new GGP triple, G alpha, H alpha, and C alpha, okay. And uh, you can show that they share the same Lennox Du group. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, then the conjecture of Gain, Gruss, and Poisson says that for any generic L parameter phi uh, from a weighted link group of F to LG uh, with L packet uh, pi G phi, then if you sum the multiplicity over the whole Vogan packet, then it's identically one. Okay. Moreover, the non-vanishing of the multiplicity is detected by the representation of the component group A phi attached to phi, okay, which is related to the sign of the relevant local simplicity root numbers. Here, a parameter is called generic if the adjoint L function for this parameter is holomorphic at S equals one, and it is tempered if the image is bounded, okay. <clears throat> Uh, then let's review some known results uh, for the conjecture. Uh, when F is p-adic, uh, wasp uh, proved the temper case of the conjecture and uh, later Mogolin and wasp proved the whole generic part of the conjecture complete, completely when F is p-adic. Okay, uh, here we need to assume, uh, assume the local lens correspondence for non-quasi-split uh, orthogonal groups. And uh, you need a refinement for even also no group, okay. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the local gangrus Poisson conjecture speculates uh, parallel behaviors for unitary groups. You can also talk about the conjecture for a pair of Hermitian spaces, okay. Then it's proved by refer uh, refer policies uh, in the temple case uh, by Gang and Ichino for the generic case, okay, when F is periodic. <coughs> And uh, there are parallel conjectures for school emission unitary groups and the uh, symplectic metaplectic groups. Okay, usually it's called the uh, Fourier Jacobi case. Okay, then again, Ichino proved the conjecture for school emission unitary groups, and Atobi uh, proved the conjecture for symplectic and metaplectic groups uh, through the technique of theta correspondence when f is periodic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, then let's talk about what is known when f is Archimedean. Okay. <clears throat> then for unitary groups where f is equal to r, um, Bezoplisis proof the multiplicity part of the conjecture for phi tempered. And he proved the conjecture for discrete series representations. And uh, she proved the conjecture for tempered parameters. <clears throat> and for special sonal groups uh, where f is equal to C, uh, Moller proved the conjecture for SON cross SON plus one, okay. <clears throat> uh, so the result that I'm going to state today is that in a special orthogonal group setting, uh, we proved the multiplicity part for temper parameters of, uh, temper pra L parameters of special orthogonal groups, okay. <clears throat> and then we follow the approach of WASPJ and uh, uh, builds up the C's, okay. <clears throat> so for any phi, uh, pi is a temporary representation of G uh, by forbidden reciprocity for unitary representations, uh, the home space that we are considering uh, is isomorphic to the GF equivalent space uh, from pi to the L2 induction from H to G of CF, okay. <clears throat> 
Therefore, uh, just like the case of spherical harmonics, uh, we are going to study the spectral decomposition of GF acting on the L2 space, okay. Then following the idea of Arthur, uh, we can use the CC infinity functions on GF act, acting on this L2 space uh, through conv convolution, okay. Um, for any F, which is a test function on G and X in GF, and phi is uh, L2, func of L2 function in this quotient space, <laughs> we consider the uh, right translation action of F on phi, okay which is integration on GF of FG phi XG. Then it turns out that uh, you just do simple change of variable. Uh, this, uh, this integral operator can be written as the following operator on H uh, on G quotient H. Here KF is integral on HF of FX inverse HY of C uh, F A D H. Okay. So the upshot here is that IF has an integral kernel given by KF XY, okay. Then I think it's not surprising that we are gonna try to compute the trace of this kernel operator. <clears throat> so formally, you expect that the trace of IF can be computed through integrating along the diagonal, okay, uh, for the kernel function. Then just like the case for uh, Arthur's local trace formula, in general, this integral it's not absolutely convergent, okay. So instead of working with general test function, we work, we work with uh, strongly cuspidal functions. So a function f is called strongly cuspidal if it's parabolic descent to uh, any not proper parabolic of g is equal to zero identically, okay. <laughs> uh, and similarly, you can define the notion of strongly cuspidal functions in the Hirschhausen Schwarz space of GF, which is denoted by uh, C strongly cuspid of GF. Okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> uh, so at priori, you might feel that the notion of strongly cuspid of functions, uh, I mean, the requirement is pretty strong, but it turns out that in Arthur's lo local trace formula, you have two test functions on G. If you assume one, function to be strongly cuspidal, then it can greatly simplify your local trace formula and uh, it still captures a large portion of the spectrum. Okay. So the theorem is that for F, which is a strongly cuspidal function on G, then indeed, uh, I mean, the trace distribution is, is well defined, it's absolutely convergent, okay. <clears throat> Then the next goal is to define the spectral and the geometric expansion for GF. And the key point is to compare with Arthur's local trace formula, okay. <clears throat> uh, then let's first uh, talk about the spectral expansion. Um, for any strongly cuspidal function on G, we said uh, the following spectral expansion, J spec F to be the integral on XGF. Here XGF is the following set. Here M is a V of G and the sigma is a elliptic representation of MF and the modular conjugation, okay. Then this set has a natural uh, measure there, okay. <clears throat> which, is, which is similar to the Planchot measure, okay. Then we can prove that the spectral expansion is absolutely convergent and indeed it is equal to your, to your original trace distribution, okay. And uh, M pi is the multiplicity that we are considering and the d pi is some discriminant factor, okay. And uh, for pi, which is attached to a elliptic representation m sigma, <clears throat> theta f pi is the weighted character defined by us, okay. <clears throat> Here ag and am are just some constant uh, uh, attached to m and g, okay. <clears throat> Uh, then to prove the spectral expansion, there are the following steps. First, you are going to introduce a temporal intertwining, um, which is an operator from the uh, and and the ring of pi to c. Okay, and uh, to prove that the temporal intertwining is non-zero, if and only if the multiplicity is non-zero. And the idea has already appeared in 
the work of a lot of people, including Wasp J, the P. Mao, and the Circularity Spanish, and the Buzza Plisis. Okay. So for any uh, T in the anamorphism space, you define L, L pi T to be the regularized integral on HF of trace pi H inverse T uh, CFH DH. Okay. And in general, the integral is not absolutely convergent and you need to do some regularization. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay. Then the next step is to insert the temper intertwining operator into the Plancher formula on GF. Okay. So more precisely, let's recall that our kernel function is written by integral on HF of F, X inverse HX. Okay. Then you write F by the Plancher transform and uh, you show that the whole integral is absolutely convergent so that trace of F combining with the C integral gives you L pi, okay. Then you integrate on the whole temper spectrum of GF, okay. Then you can show that both sides are con continuous, okay. And you can, in particular, you can always assume that the function F have uh, has compatible supported the Plancher transform, okay. And by companies, in particular, you can choose some function f prime, which is a Hirschhausen Schwarz function of G, such that um, if you apply the temporal intertwining operator to pi f prime, you just get the multiplicity uh, of m pi, okay, for any pi, which is a temporal representation of GF with pi f now equal to zero, okay. Then you are going to insert the multiplicity, uh, multiplicity here into the integral formula here, because you know that L pi is non-zero if and only if M pi is non-zero, and all M pi if it's non-zero is always equal to one. Therefore, your KF can be written as L pi of pi x pi f pi x inverse, and here is the multiplicity. Okay, this is exactly the multiplicity. And then we can try to compare the resulting formula with the spectral side of Arthur's local trace formula. Then after you write the KF in this form, then you can apply the Plancher inversion back, okay? And then write the final integral in this form. So it's F of X inverse HG H prime X and F prime G. And then you have two Cassie integrals attached to L pi here and L pi here, okay? Then the, by definition, your JF is just integral on HF, a GF quotient HF of the integral on the right-hand side. Then I think it's not surprising that you are gonna do some change of variables and uh, glue the integral on GF quotient HF and HF together, okay. <clears throat> then after introducing truncation, you need to show that integral order can be switched. And uh, finally, you glue the HF integral and the GF quotient HF, then your JF can be written of the following form. It's here the inner integral is F of G prime inverse HG G prime and F prime G. And here you have double integral on GF GF. Then the key point is that this part actually is exactly recovers the other local trace formula, okay. The inner, in particular, the inner integral is exactly Arthur's local trace formula, okay. Then you can express it in terms of the spectral expansion of Arthur's local trace formula attached to F and F prime. And the key point is that if you assume one function to be strongly cuspidal, then your expression can be greatly simplified, okay. Then your final expression is that it just gives you the integral on uh, XGF of d pi here and uh, here is theta f pi. This term comes from, uh, comes from Arthur's, Arthur's uh, local trace formula, okay. And uh, in Arthur's local trace formula, the, uh, the, dis uh, the distribution attached to f prime is the character, character, the ordinary character of pi, okay. Then for the ordinary character of pi, you integrate with the C here, then you just get the L pi, pi f prime here, okay and which just gives you the multiplicity. So this is how you derive the spectral expansion of J, okay. Uh, so, so any question on the spectral expansion? Okay, if no question, then let's move to the geometric expansion. So uh, the, the key part for the, uh, 
for the proof of the local gain growth per cell conjecture following the approach of wasp J is that you are going to prove a multiplicity formula, geometric multiplicity formula for any temporary representation of G, okay. So for pi, which is a temporary representation of G, um, then we prove that the multiplicity is equal to the following geometric expansion, uh, which is some constant, uh, which is some function C pi X that we are going to define later. And DGX and delta X are some discriminant factors, okay and they integrate on a, on a set of conjugacy classes, which we denoted by gamma GH, okay. And when F is periodic, it, it was already proved by Wasper J, okay. So let's uh, explain all the notations appearing here, okay. So gamma GH is the union over some sub-torus of SOW, okay. So the key point is that, is that those torus might not be maximal, okay. Uh, and the torus is in T if and only if T is maximal elliptic in SO W double prime, okay. Where W double prime is a non degenerate subspace of W and the dimension of W quotient W prime is even, okay. So, so, so this set really comes from the centralizer of semi simple elements, uh, semi simple elements in, in H actually, okay. Uh, then let's turn to the definition of the function C pi there, okay, uh, which is uh, the main technical ingredient uh, in the geometric expansion. So before we start, let's record the following classical results, which is proved by Hirschhandler when f is piadic and uh, Babish Vogel when f is Archimedean, okay. So for any x, which is a semi simple point in G and uh, capital X, lies in a small neighborhood of the centralizer of, uh, of the Lie algebra, G, okay. Then you have the following joint expansion, okay. There exists constant C pi O attached to Neopot regular Neopotent orbits in GX, such that you have the following identity, okay. Uh, you let X tend to zero of DGX, X e to the X one half times the character distribution of pi evaluate at X e to the x, then this is equal to dgx one half and the sum over uh, regular Neopotent orbits and the sum constant function c pi o x and uh, uh, j hat o x, okay. Here j hat o x is the Fourier transform of the Neopotent orbital integral attached to the orb regular Neopotent orbit, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, here I, I would like to mention that the original formula of Babbage of Vogel is the asymptotic formula. Uh, they write the character distribution here as a uh, as the sum of c pi o x and the j hat o x plus some additional term. Then the key point is that if you multiply by the discriminant and the let x tend to zero, then you can indeed you can show the remaining term tend to zero. Okay. <laughs> and here um, for the definition of C pi, it first appeared in the work of Wasper J and uh, it's the main technical ingredient, okay. And the C pi, I think it is not surprising. It is not non-zero only when GX is quasi-split, okay. GX is, is, is the centralizer of, of X in G, okay. And when it is the case, uh, we are going to pick up a particular regular Neopotent orbit in GX, okay. And it defines C pi to be C pi O, okay. Um, then um, the key difference between oson special orthogonal groups and the unitary group case is that um, for unitary group case, then the regular Neopotent orbits can be permuted by scaling. And in particular, your geometric multiplicity formula is independent of the orbit that you are going to choose, okay. So in particular, you can take your C pi to be the average germ. Okay, you sum over all the regular Neopotent orbits in GX and the C pi O and uh, divide by the cardinality, okay. Then the benefit is that if you define your germ expansion, uh, I mean, if you define your C pi in this way, then you have the following elegant formula re relating C pi with the character distribution of pi, okay. Uh, in, uh, more precisely, uh, dgx one half times c pi x x is equal to a limit of x prime, which lies in the quasi split torus uh, of gx. Okay, you let it tend to x, 
then this is the, uh, I think there's a one half, I, I forget right here. So DG X prime one half theta pi X prime over the cardinality of the wire group, okay. Then in particular, you have a direct relation between uh, the germ here and the character, uh, character distribution of pi, okay. Unfortunately, it is not the case for special orthogonal groups. You really need to pick up a particular particular regular Neopotent orbit, okay. Uh, then let's briefly review, um, let's briefly review the parametrization of regular Neopotent orbit in special orthogonal groups, okay. So let's, uh, so first, the, uh, the set of regular Neopotent orbits in SOV is now empty if and only if VQ is quasi-split, okay. Uh, in particular, for dimensional v odd or lower than equal to two, then you can show that regular Neopotent orbit is equal to one identically. Okay. Then in this case, you do not need to choose a particular orbit. Uh, when dimension of v is even and greater than equal to four, you set the following set n v to be f cross. Uh, I mean f cross over f cross square. Okay. If if, if v q is split. Okay. And you let it to be the in, image of the anisotropic component of phi over uh, f cross square if vq is quasi split of all uh, but non split okay then uh, through some computation you can find that mv is in bijection with your regular neopotent orbit in sov okay in particular your g which is written by sow cross sov then it's parametrized by NV if dimension of V is even and greater than or equal to four. And it's parametrized by NW if the dimension of W is greater than or equal to four and it's even, okay. <clears throat> uh, then uh, let's see what is a particular regular Neopotent orbit that we are going to choose, okay. Let's recall that our V is the direct sum of W with the isotropic line which is generated by some vector V zero and a split space Z, okay. Then we let mu zero to be the quadratic form Q evaluating at V zero, okay. And then you can show that when dimension of V is even and greater than or equal to four, mu zero lies in the parametrizing set, okay. When dimension of W is even and greater than or equal to four, then minus of mu zero lies in uh, NW, okay. Uh, then uh, for X, which is a regular set in the uh, geometric support, I mean, this parameterize your geometric support, you let V prime X to be the kernel of one minus X in V, okay. And uh, W prime X to be the kernel of one minus X in W, okay. Then you can show that your centralizer has the following decomposition, okay. It's the product of a smaller gang growth per set triple and uh, G double prime X is T cross T, okay. And in particular, uh, in particular, this part gives you H and uh, HX is the direct, direct product of two copies, which is SOW prime X and T and up to a unipotent factor, okay. Then when G prime X is quasi split, you set C pi X to be the regular neopotent, uh, the germ associated to the regular neopotent orbit O of mu zero if dimension of v prime x is bigger than equal to four and it's even, okay. And uh, it's equal to c pi of O minus mu zero if the dimension of w prime x is greater than equal to four and it's even. And it's just the uh, original germ if you only have one orbit, okay. So as priori, you, you might wonder why it is the case later uh, when, we, uh, when we are going to descend everything to Lie algebra, then you will understand why it is the case, okay. <clears throat> then let's first talk about the proof for the local grand gross per side conjecture for temporary L parameters. Uh, then the following properties are needed for a temporary L parameter. Uh, so more precisely, the first property is that um, for any pure inner form, I mean for alpha, you can associate to a pure inner form, then the sum of the character distribution in a temporary L L packet, okay, this is a stable distribution, okay. The second property is the transfer property. So more precisely, there are some transfer between the stable character 
uh, between a stable character on G and its pure inner forms, okay. And the constant is related by the cotton sign, okay. In particular, um, the cotton sign lies in, uh, is equal to plus one or minus one, okay. If F is not equal to C, okay. Uh, and uh, the last property is that for G, a quasi split group, and uh, for every regular neopotent orbit O in G, there exists a unique uh, represent unique representation in your temporary representation in your, in your temporary L parameter, which is generic. Okay, generic of type O. Okay. And for these properties, uh, when F is Archimedean, the local lens correspondence is known by the work of Lenz, and uh, the st stability of the character and uh, the transfer is known by the work of Schausted. Okay, and the Whittaker property follows from uh, the work of Cost and Vogel. Okay. And then when F is piadic, the local lens correspondence is known from other for quasi-split quasi special orthogonal groups. And in particular, you need some refinement um, for even orthogonal groups, okay. And for non-quasi-split special orthogonal groups, it is expected to fall from the last chapter of Arthur's book, okay. <clears throat> then, uh, then we also established the following formula. So at priori, um, you need to particular uh, pick up a particular regular neopotent orbit when you define a germ there. Okay, then uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, but for the for a stable character, okay, for a stable character, you sum over pi in uh, you sum over all the pi in your temporal L packet. Then for the germ of the stable stable uh, stable character, then their germs are equal to each other for any for any regular neopotent orbits in GX, okay. In particular, for stable, for stable characters, the associate, uh, the associate, associate germ can also be related to the ordinary, original, original stable character of pi, okay. Um, okay. Then um, you sum over all the multiplicities and you replace the multiplicity by the geometric expansion, then for uh, then it is really just the sum over all the pure inner forms and uh, this is the codable sign, okay. Then the point, uh, point here is that because you have some alternating here, I mean the codable sign is plus minus one. Therefore, if X is not equal to one, then your sum here is identically zero, okay. Then eventually you only recover the, recover the summation here attached to X equals one. Then this part follows from the work of Rodia when F is piadic and by Matumoto when F is Archimedean, you know that indeed it is always equal to one, okay? Therefore you just prove the multiplicity part of the conjecture, okay? <clears throat> so, so any questions? Okay, if no question, then let's continue. Um, then I think it is not surprising that the key point is that you are going to prove a uh, geometric expansion for your original trace distribution, okay. So for F, which is a strongly cuspidal function on GF, you set the geometric expansion of F to be the integral on gamma GH of C, F, X, and this is some discriminant. Okay, it is really parallel to the, it is really parallel to the geometric multiplicity expansion. And what is CF? The CF is the, germ attached to the following conjugation invariant distribution attached to F, okay. So theta Fx is equal to uh, the weighted orbital integrals defined by Arthur, okay. Here Mx, uh, Mx is the centralizer of X in G, okay, which, which is the minimal Levy, um, probably I should say in the following way. This is the minimal Levy of G containing X, okay. Then the point here is that you see that the distribution theta fx is actually conjugation invariant, okay. Uh, and uh, moreover, it is a quasi character in the sense that it also has the joint expansion property like the character distribution of pi, okay. Uh, then you define cfx to be c theta f o mu zero if the dimension of b prime x is greater than equal to four and is even and you define it to be C theta F O of minus mu zero if the dimension of W prime X is greater than equal to four and even, 
and they, it is attached to the unique regular nilpotent orbit of theta f otherwise, okay. <laughs> Uh, then the proof of the geometry expansion is somehow kind of different from the spectral expansion. And the reason we will, we will see later, okay. So by partition of unity, we can separate the proof to two cases. The first case is that the su support of theta f lies in a neighborhood of x, which is not equal to zero, okay. And the second case is the support of theta f lies in a neighborhood of x equal, z or x equal one, sorry. <clears throat> Then the point is that when x is not equal to one, um, if it's supported in a small neighborhood of x equal not, not equal to one, then the centralizer of, of G, uh, I mean, I wrote it here, GX, HX, and CX, then it is really the product of two triples. The first triple is the GGP triple of smaller dimension, okay. And the second triple, it's just like the triple attached to the other local trace formula. Okay, this is diagonal embedding of some group H double prime X embed into H prime double X or H double prime X cross H double prime X. Okay. Then indeed you can prove the conjecture by induction on dimension because this GGP triple is of smaller dimension and the second triple is a uh, other triple. So you can define it using, the, uh, you can compute it using the other's local trace formula. Okay. Then the most technical, most technical part is when theta, support of theta f lies in a neighborhood of x equals one, okay. <laughs> um, then, then here we are going to use exponential map to descend to the Lie algebra, okay. Uh, I think it's not surprising that you can define the Lie algebra variance for your distribution J and the J geometric. <laughs> then, uh, then I think it is, uh, Important, uh, important point that the geometric expansion of F contains the asymptotic of weighted orbital integrals near singular locus because it involves germ expansion. But the other's local trace formula only has regular semi simple locus. So I think it's not surprising that you cannot compare the two directly, okay. Uh, so uh, to resolve the possible singularities, we are going to perform a Fourier transform on the algebra H, okay. Um, so more precisely, the original kernel distribution on the algebra is equal to the integral on the Lie algebra of H of F uh, G X G inverse of CF, uh, let me see, uh, CF X, okay. CF X is just a character attached, attached to C, okay, anyway. And then because this is a vector space, inside G, then you can do a Fourier transform, okay? And uh, it can be written as a Fourier transform of F on G and the G inverse XG, okay? Here, the capital C is some element attached to your Fourier transform additive character here, okay? Then the Lie algebra expansion of your, uh, the Lie algebra expansion of your distribution J is just integral on GF quotient HF DG and uh, on the C plus H perp, okay. F hat G inverse X G D, DX, okay. Um, then uh, after you perform the Fourier transform, it turns out that it turns out that indeed you can compare with others local trace formula, okay. So after introducing truncation and then changing integration order, you can compare with others weighted orbital integrals. And you can prove the following statement. For f, which is the strongly cuspidal function on the algebra gf, I mean on the algebra you can also define the notion of strongly cuspidal function, which says that it, again you do parabolic descent, okay, um, along the Lie algebra. I mean, um, then your Lie algebra uh, trace formula is of the following form, okay. This is really dgx one half of theta attached to F hat X here, theta is just a conjugation invariant distribution attached to a strongly cuspidal function that we defined in the, defined previously, okay. And the gamma of C plus H perp is G conjugacy classes of uh, regular semi-simple elements in uh, C plus H perp, okay. Um, uh, then, 
we are going to take Fourier transform back. Okay, here, here we already defined Fourier transform. Uh, then we are going to take the Fourier transform back. Okay. So more precisely, uh, you can apply Fourier transform for quasi characters. Okay, which is proved by Bezier-Plessis. Okay. Um, so for any function f, you attach it to a quasi character theta f. Okay. Then it is equal to integral on gamma g. Here, gamma g is a set of regular semi-simple elements in g, okay. And here's dgx one half, and it's the positive character attached to f hat, okay. And here's j hat x. And what is j hat x? Here, j hat x is the full transform of your uh, orbital integral distribution, the regular orbital integral, okay. And in particular, it is it also has the joint expansion. I think uh, it is known, uh, it is known by Schleiger when f is piadic, okay. And by, it can be deduced from the work of Bezier-Plessis when f is Archimedean, okay. This is really just a regular germ appearing in your germ expansion if f is piadic, okay. <clears throat> okay, let me see. Yeah, uh, okay. And in particular, from the expression here, you see here you have the, uh, here you have the for transform of regular for transform of regular orbital integrals. Then we can take the leading germ, I mean the regular germ on both sides. Okay. Then it turns out that for any regular neopotent orbital O of G, then we take the uh, regular germ attached to O on both sides. Then C of theta F O uh, at, at zero is equal to the integral on gamma G of dgx x one half and then the theta of f hat x and uh, gamma o x. Okay. <laughs> then you, you see that the expression on the right hand side is strictly similar to your the uh, to your Lie algebra expansion. So let's see the Lie algebra expansion that we prove is of the following form. So the only difference between the Lie algebra trace formula that we prove here and the Fourier transform of Classic character is, is that you need some ex explicit expression for the germ, okay? And uh, here, the regular, the G conjugacy class of regular semi simple elements is just a subset of gamma G, okay? So, indeed, you need explicit formulas for those regular germs, okay? <laughs> uh, then uh, we prove the following theorem, okay? In particular, you can show the regular germ is always equal to one or zero, okay? So more precisely, for G, a quasi-split reductive algebraic group, and the X is a regular semi-simple element in G, and for O, a regular neopotent orbit of G, you let TG to be the centralizer of X in G, then you can prove that the regular neopotent germ there is equal to one if uh, this is some endoscopic invariance that we're going to introduce later, okay? So INVX, times INV of TG is equal to INV of TGO, okay, and zero otherwise. When F is piadic, the result was already proved by Schauster, okay. Um, okay. And uh, let me briefly explain all the notations appearing here. So to talk about the endoscopic invariance, you need to fix the F splitting for G, which is uh, a Borel pair and there's some, um, some elements in your root space, okay. Then, INVTG and INVX and INVTGO, they all lie in H1, F of TG, okay. And uh, the invariant attached to TG and O measures the difference between your regular neopotent orbit and the regular neopotent element determined by the F fixed F splitting, okay. So if you fix uh, F splitting, you, um, then, it's, then it's equivalent to choosing a regular neopotent orbit, okay. And the INV of TG is connected with the lyons schauster transfer factor delta one, okay. And the INV X is connected with the lyons schauster transfer factor delta two, okay. And uh, moreover, based on result of Cottonwood's, we also proved the following theorem. Um, the regular neopotent germ, I mean gamma O X is equal to one, if and only if the GF orbit of X and O lies in the same common uh, uh, I mean, like in the GF orbit of a common constant section. So roughly speaking, uh, constant constructed a section for the Chevrolet quotient G to 
G G I T quotient by adjoint quotient, okay, whose image in G contains only regular elements and meets every regular stable adjoint orbit exactly once, okay. Here, let me remind you that regular elements in G might not be semi-simple, okay. So it's defined to be the elements in G such that the dimension of the centralizer is equal to the dimension of your torus, okay, the uh, maximal torus. So for instance, regular Neopotent elements are always regular, okay. Mm, okay. Then uh, using the formula here, uh, using the formula here, uh, we are going to prove the final formula, okay, uh, uh, final geometric expansion, okay. So here's an important theorem. Um, although originally the requirement that every strong cuspidal looks pretty strong, it turns out that if you form the invariant distribution theta f attached to it, then it is dense in the space of quasi characters on GF when f is real or poietic. Okay. Moreover, if you take the Fourier transform of your quasi character, it's equivalent to taking the Fourier transform of your f and attach to the quasi character. Okay. Uh, therefore, because it stands by continuity, we are reduced to show that for any quasi character theta, J Lee theta is equal to J Lee of geometry theta. Okay. So indeed, you can replace all the expressions that we proved before and defined before by a quasi character theta. Okay. So J Lee theta is integral on gamma C plus H perp of discriminant DG X one half and the theta hat X. Okay. And the J Lee geometric theta is just the, I mean, originally we defined a set gamma GH, then it's not hard to define its Lie algebra variance. Then this is the germ C theta X and the DD X one half and the delta X minus one half. Okay. So we are reduced to show that uh, these two expressions are equal to each other, okay. <laughs> uh, then an important reduction is that you can show that both distributions have some homogeneity, okay. So more precisely, if you replace the quasi character theta by theta lambda, here theta lambda is some scaling, okay. Then it is equal to the original, original, original expression times lambda to the power delta g over two. Here delta g is some constant attached to g, okay. And similarly, you have the same homogeneity for j Lee theta, okay. Then you can show that the subtraction of these two distributions is equal to the linear combination of uh, regular neopotent orbits O in G and uh, some constant C O in C. And uh, this is a germ of theta at O evaluated as zero, okay. So this is really something using the, um, I mean, in the, at least in the PID case, you can use some dimension argument. The key point is that these two distributions are equal to each other when theta is not supported at a neighborhood of zero. Then on the other hand, you have this homogeneity, then indeed you can just prove that their subtraction is just some linear combination of the regular gen attached to theta, okay. And uh, here let's recall that C theta O zero is equal to the following, uh, I mean, it's deduced from the Fourier inversion formula for quasi characters, okay. Here is integral on gamma G of DG X one half and see the hat of gamma, uh, gamma O X, okay. And the point here is that gamma O X is either equal to zero or one, okay. When it's equal to one, you can easily see that it's directly related to your uh, direct, directly related to your Lie algebra trace distribution, okay. Then you are to prove that all the constant CO are equal, are equal to zero for any X, uh, we are going to choose an X, which is um, regular semi-simple in G, such that the centralizer of X in in, in G, which is um, which is a Lie algebra of a maximal torus, and you take the G conjugacy classes, okay. Then you assume that its intersection with your geometric support is equal to zero, okay. A typical example is that if you let X to be regular semi-simple in the quasi-split Lie algebra, then its intersection with gamma GH is always equal to zero because by definition, gamma GH there has elliptic property. I mean, it's some elliptic elements in some subtorial, so it cannot be quasi-split, okay. Then for those X, 
we can attach it with quasi character theta x to be j hat of x supported on the g conjugacy classes of t tx. Okay. In particular, you find that because we define c, uh, theta x to be the for transform of, of the regular orbital integral. Therefore, if you take the germ at zero for theta x, then it's exactly equal to the germ associated to the orbital integral. Okay, it's just a gamma O x. And uh, because the G conjugacy of tx intersect with gamma gh is equal to zero. So if you plug theta x into your geometric expansion of your Lie algebra trace, okay, then you just get gamma O x when you have only one regular neopotent orbit and it's equal to gamma O mu zero X if dimension V is even and greater than equal to four, okay. And the gamma O of minus mu zero X if dimension of W is even and greater than equal to four, okay. And similarly, um, if you plug in, uh, plug such theta X into your, the algebra trace distribution, then you can see that um, if gamma, uh, I mean, the expression there, the expression there is non-zero only when gamma O X is equal to one, okay. And when it is the case, I mean, also you need to assume that X lies in C plus H perp. And when it is the case, then it is really just the Fourier inversion formula for your classic characters. And you just get C theta X O zero, okay. Which exactly just equals gamma O X. So in order to prove that these two distributions are equal to each other, the key point is that you need to show the right-hand side for J Lee geometric is equivalent to the right-hand side of, of J Lee theta X, okay. Um, then the point is that if you have only one regular neopotent orbit, then you can choose X to be a regular semi-simple element in your quasi split the algebra. Then in this case, it's not hard to prove that the regular germ is always one for any regular neopotent orbit actually. And you can also prove that X lies in C plus H perp. Therefore, these two distribution are equal to one. Therefore, if you take subtraction, indeed, you just get C CO is equal to zero, okay. Then in general, when dimension V is even or greater than equal to four uh, and greater than equal to four, then the upshot of the orbit O mu zero that we choose is that this orbit is the unique regular neopotent orbit in regular neopotent orbits in G such that if uh, the if the germ of O, uh, I mean, gamma O X is equal to one, then X always lies in uh, C plus H perp. So this is the key point why we choose uh, the orbit O mu zero in your geometry expansion, okay. Okay, uh, therefore you can draw the conclusion that CO is equal to zero for any O in regular neopotent orbit of G, okay. <clears throat> then, um, I mean, you need to prove this claim. It is a quite technical claim, which is not very easy to prove. Then to prove the above claim, we need to compute explicitly for the regular neopotent orbit germs, okay. So we prove an expression for gamma OX in terms of endoscopic invariance. Then we further need to give an explicit formula for those invariants and the fine relation between those invariants and uh, when X lies in your geometric support, uh, it's H perp, sorry, it's a typo. Then we compute the invariance explicitly uh, for any X in regular semi-simple elements of G without eigenvalue zero uh, following the work of Wasper J. And uh, finally, we can deduce that indeed the claim here holds, okay. So this claim is quite technical, but um, but when you work with general spherical varieties, you, you also need to choose a particular regular neopotent orbit uh, when you write down the geometric expansion, okay. <laughs> then this is, in general, this is the criteria that you are going to use, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, my, my talk is over, yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Questions, please.
Uh, may I ask one ask one question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for the spectral expansion, so why you need to relate to the Arthur's trace formula? Uh, I don't so, see that. So you don't, let, let, yeah, let, let's see the proof. Okay, let's see the proof. So, so the proof of spectral expansion actually is, I mean, the steps are quite clear. You first introduce a temporal intertwining, which is just integral, like integral of matrix coefficient on your spherical subgroup. Okay, you need to recognize that. Then you insert this formula into your Planchot formula. Okay, I mean, here, your kernel function, you write it in terms of Planchot inversion. Then, I mean, Planchot inversion, you have trace of F, right? Then trace of F integral with your C. I mean, here's a C. I also dropped that. Uh, then you just get the temporal intertwining there. Then you insert the temporal intertwining there by a multiplicity formula because temporal intertwining is not zero if and only if your multiplicity is not zero, then you can choose some function and insert it into the expansion here and it does not affect your uh, kernel function, okay. So then, what do we mean by inserting? So you are inserting? Yeah, we insert this factor into, your, uh, into, into our expansion for KFx. So this is, uh, so this is a one. Yeah, this is always one. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. This is always one. And it's okay. not it's not zero if and only if your L pi is not zero. Okay. Yeah, then for for this expression, we apply the puncture inversion back. Okay. Then you can write it in this form. Uh, then we we I mean we then we just do integration. Okay, it's GF HF, I mean integration. Then the key point here is that you do change your variable, okay? You can glue one copy of HF with the quotient space here, okay? Then you, you get the inner integral here. And the inner integral here is indeed just Arthur's local trace formula, right? The double integral in G. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, that, that's how, uh, yeah. Then, then you use the special expansion of Arthur's local trace formula and you get the... You but get the, is this kind of like a shortcut, like you cannot, deduce the, the spectral expansion directly like Arthur's, you, you do, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's a, the key point here is that we assume one function to be strongly cuspidal. So, okay. so, so indeed the convergence issue here, I mean, you, in particular, you do not need to introduce truncation here. Okay. You can prove that it's indeed, it's absolutely convergent. Yeah, that, that's the point. We assume one function to be strongly cuspidal. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious whether there's a way to deduce the spectral expansion directly without like, uh, kind of playing this trick and uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe a, I don't understand this, but <laughs> it's, it's a good question. Um, but, but overall, the whole proof really relies comparison with Arthur's local trace formula, including the geometric expansion. Okay, so on the geometric side, you also do something like this to kind of uh, Geometric side, we are not directly comparing with Arthur's trace formula because you see in the geometric expansion, you have asymptotic of orbital integrals, right? You have germs there. So you cannot compare with Arthur's local trace formula directly because Arthur's local trace formula all, all only have regular semi-simple locus. So the point yeah. here is that you see when X is not supported at, at identity, it's the product of two triples. The first triple is the GGP triple of smaller dimension. And the second triple is really a, a triple of Arthur's type. Okay. Then for, for this part, you can use the Arthur's local trace formula and get the geometric expansion portionally. And mm -hmm. uh, fi finally, when you are going to prove the equality when X is supported at the neighborhood of identity, then you are going to descend to the Lie algebra and it turns out you need to perform a Fourier transform because you know that the geometric expansion involves involves the involves the sing, uh, asymptotic of orbital integrals near singular locus. So it turns out you need to do some Fourier transform to resolve that those kind of singularities. Then the key point is that after you do Fourier transform, your final formula can be compared with others weighted orbital integrals. Uh, okay. 
And also yeah. another question, I, uh, is there any relation between your multiphasic formula with uh, Chen Wen's multiphasic formula? It seems like he have a more like general. Uh, uh, it's, it's exactly recovers that case. I, I mean, it's, it's exactly a particular case there. Yeah. Uh, but he, I don't know, like uh, he seems to, uh, maybe also including our comedian case, he, he formulates a conjecture and uh, yeah, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know, like uh, the way he proved these kind of formulas is also kind of converting back to Arthur's, uh, like a comparison um, with Arthur trace formula. Or uh, he did not prove, he did not prove the multiplicity formula. So, okay, so, in general. So, so, which model are you referring to? I, are you referring to his general conjecture or some particular model? Uh, so I guess your case is kind of like. Uh, Part of his general conjecture yeah. is that right? Yeah, so, so in his conjecture, you always sound, you always have some geometric support, and you always need to pick up some germ there. Mm -hmm. And but but keep on for all the previous known cases, like unitary mm -hmm. group case or or the Ginzburg Rallis cases, that you do not need to pick up a particular germ, because uh, I mean for unitary group. The germ there can be permitted by scaling by imaginary i there. Therefore, your expression does not affect if you multiply by i. So indeed, you can just take the average, and you do not need to do those those kind of complicated works to select a particular germ. And for GL, mm -hmm. I mean, you only, you just have one orbit. But uh, for special orthogonal groups, unfortunately, indeed, you need to pick up the particular regular Newton orbit there. So in okay. his yeah in his uh, geometric expansion, you can see that he also needs to introduce a particular orbit, okay. And the, the geometric support actually is exactly equal to the one that he defined. And more precisely, the geometric support are always some elliptic subtorus in H. Let's assume H semi-simple, otherwise you can coach in the center. These are always some elliptic subtorus in H so that its centralizer is some, its centralizer is some other spherical pairs. Yeah, for details, you can check his paper. And in particular, in GGP case, it exactly recovers the gamma GH here. Okay. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, no problem. <laughs> so does this sound okay or still confused? Uh, maybe I need to look at the papers. I, I don't know, like uh, I thought that maybe it's like uh, kind of a parallel development, development of trace formula kind of, but I'm, I don't know, like uh, you need to reduce to Arthur's trace formula or you have to. So, so as I remember the previous work of Rafael and the Trinwan, they, I mean, all the works need to, need to compare with Arthur's local trace formula. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, whether anything is known in the positive characteristic. Oh, oh. Uh, does, does Arthur's local trace formula apply to positive characteristic? Um, I mean, it might apply, but at least I remember that his work always assumed like a local field of characteristic zero. Uh, so, yes, and you need this for symptotic expansion and for exponents. There, right. there would be a lot of difficulties. I just wanted to ask whether so, uh, there are any works that at least start this. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds, yeah. Uh, mm. I'm I'm not I'm not sure if you can do it for positive characteristic for all kind of problems. There is. I mean that's I don't think Arthur Arthur is always for characteristic zero. I see. The reason I'm interested is that my student Dor Metzer recently com completed the proof of multiplicity one in positive characteristic. Oh I see. But 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 use use but use different strategy, right? Yes, yeah, the multiplicity one is using uh, different Kashdan approach with invariant distributions. So yeah, I see. Different. I see. But I think it's likely, but 
but you need to develop all the all the machineries in positive characteristic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, any further questions? Okay. Yeah. If, if uh, not, then uh, let me just say that uh, next week there will be a talk uh, by Nir Avni on a slightly different topic on arithmetic groups. Uh, I, I will have the abstract uh, tomorrow, I guess, I will post it on the calendar. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again for the talk and thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.